Welcome to Fortune Forecast. I am your hostess, Daisy Raisler. So we've been together now on this journey with the Edinburgh Lectures on Mental Science by Thomas Troward. In the previous chapter, the big takeaways for me was when he described the three facts regarding the subjective mind were that it's got creative power, that it's amenable to suggestion, it doesn't matter what, from what source, and that it has an inability to work by any other than the deductive method. Therefore, whatever you will, that is the command, and it goes for it. So, wouldn't we be more on guard with our thoughts and and also see how creation is just unlimited and potential is just as unlimited as that? Well, so excited to see what will be revealed in the next chapter. Are you ready? Come join me. This book is found in the public domain in the United States. Let's move on to chapter 14, The Body. Some students find it difficult to realize that mental action can produce any real effect upon material substance. But if this is not possible, there is no such thing as mental science the purpose of which is to produce improved conditions both of body and environment, so that the ultimate manifestation aimed at is always one of demonstration upon the plane of the visible and concrete. Therefore, to afford conviction of an actual connection between the visible and the invisible, between the inner and the outer, is one of the most important points in the course of our studies. That such a connection must exist is proved by metaphysical argument in answer to the question, how did anything ever come into existence at all? And the whole creation, ourselves included, stands as evidence to this great truth. But to many minds, merely abstract argument is not completely convincing. Or at any rate, it becomes more convincing if it is supported by something of a more concrete nature. And for such readers, I would give a few hints as to the correspondence between the physical and the mental. The subject covers a very wide area and the limited space at my disposal will only allow me to touch a few suggestive points. Still, these may be sufficient to show that the abstract argument has some corresponding facts at the back of it. One of the most convincing proofs I have seen is that afforded by the biometer, a little instrument invented by an eminent French scientist, the late Dr. Hippolyte, Baraduc, which shows the action of what he calls the vital current. His theory is that this force, whatever its actual nature may be, is universally present and operates as a current of physical vitality perpetually, flowing with more or less energy through every physical organism and which can, at any rate to meet extent, be controlled by the power of the human will. The theory in all its mini minutia is exceedingly elaborate and has been described in detail in Dr. Baraduc's published works. In a conversation I had with him about a year ago, he told me he was writing another book which would throw further light on the subject. But a few months later, he passed over before it was presented to the world. The fact, however, which I wish to put 
before the reader is the ocular demonstration of the connection between mind and matter, which an experiment with the biometer affords. This instrument consists of a bell glass from the inside of which is suspended a copper needle by a fine silken thread. The glass stands on a wooden support below which is a coil of copper wire, which however is not connected with any battery or other apparatus and merely serves to condense the current. Below the needle inside the glass there is a circular card divided into degrees to mark the action of the needle. Two of these instruments are placed side by side, but in no way connected, and the, exper the experimenter then holds out the fingers of both hands to within about an inch of the glass. According to the theory, the current enters at the left hand, circulates through the body, and passes out at the right hand. That is to say, there is an indrawing at the left and a giving out at the right, thus agreeing with Rickenbach's experiment on the polarity of the human body. I must confess that although I had read Dr. Baraduk's book, Le Vibrations Humaines, I approached the instrument in a very skeptical frame of mind, but I was soon convinced of my error at first, holding a mental attitude of entire relaxation, I found that the left-hand needle was attracted through 20 degrees, while the right-hand needle, the one affected by the outgoing current, was repelled through 10 degrees. After allowing the instrument to return to its normal equilibrium, I again approached it with the purpose of seeing whether a change of mental attitude would in the least modify the flow of current. This time, I assumed the strongest mental attitude I could with the intention of sending out a flow through the right hand, and the result as compared with the previous one was remarkable. The left hand needle was now attracted only through 10 degrees while the right hand one was deflected through something over 30, thus clearly indicating the influence of the mental faculties in modifying the action of the current. I may mention that the experiment was made in the presence of two medical men who noted the movement of the needles. I will not here stop to discuss the question of what the actual constitution of this current of vital energy may be. It is sufficient for our present purpose that it is there, and the experiment I have described brings us face to face with the fact of a correspondence between our mental attitude and the invisible force of nature. Even if we say that this current is some form of electricity and that the variation of its action is determined by changes in the polarization of the atoms of the body, then this change of polarity is the result of mental action so that the quickening or retarding of the cosmic current is equally the result of the mental attitude whether we suppose our mental force to act directly upon the current itself or indirectly by inducing changes in the molecular structure of the body. Whichever hypothesis we adopt, the conclusion is the same, namely that the mind has power to open or close the door to invisible forces in such a way that the result of the mental action becomes apparent on the material plane. Now, investigation shows that the physical body is a mechanism especially adapted for the transmutation of the inner or mental power into modes of external activity, 
We know from medical science that the whole body is traversed by a network of nerves which serve as the channels of communication between the indwelling spiritual ego, which we call mind, and the functions of the external organism. This nervous system is dual. One system, known as the sympathetic, is the channel for all those activities which are not consciously directed by our volition, such as the operation of the digestive organs, the repair of the daily wear and tear of the tissues, and the like. The other system, known as the voluntary or cerebrospinal system, is the channel through which we receive conscious perception from the physical senses and exercise control over the movements of the body. This system has its center in the brain, while the other has its center in the ganglionic mass at the back of the stomach known as the solar plexus, and sometimes spoken as the abdominal brain. The cerebrospinal system is the channel of our volitional or conscious mental action, and the sympathetic system is the channel of that mental action which unconsciously supports the vital functions of the body. Thus, the cerebrospinal system is the organ of conscious mind and the sympathetic is that of the subconscious mind. But the interaction of conscious and subconscious mind requires a similar interaction between the corresponding system of nerves and one conspicuous connection by which this is provided in the vagus nerve. This nerve passes out of the cerebral region as a portion of the voluntary system and though and through it we control the vocal organs then it passes onwards to the thorax sending out branches to the heart and lungs and finally passing through the diaphragm it loses the outer coating which distinguishes the nerves of the voluntary system and becomes identified with those of the sympathetic system, so forming a connecting link between the two and making the man physically a single entity. Similarly, different areas of the brain indicate their connection with the objective and subjective activities of the mind respectively. And speaking in a general way, we may assign the frontal portion of the brain to the former and the posterior portion to the latter, while the intermediate portion partakes of the character of the both. The intuitional faculty has its correspondence in this upper area of the brain situated between the frontal and posterior portions and physiologically speaking. It is here that intuitive ideas find entrance. These at first are more or less unformed and generalized in character, but are nevertheless perceived by the conscious mind. Otherwise, we should not be aware of them at all. Then the effort of nature is to bring these ideas into more definite and usable shape, so the conscious mind lays hold of them and induces a corresponding vibratory current in the voluntary system of nerves. And this, in turn, induces a similar current in the involuntary system, thus handing the idea over to the subjective mind. The vibratory current, which had first descended from the apex of the brain to the frontal brain, and thus through the voluntary system to the solar plexus is now reversed and ascends from the solar plexus through the sympathetic system to the posterior brain, this return current indicating the action of the subjective mind. If we were to remove the surface portion of the apex of the brain, we should find 
immediately below it the shining belt of brain substance called the corpus callosum. This is the point of union between the subjective and objective. And as the current returns from the solar plexus to this point, it is restored to the objective portion of the brain in a fresh form which it has acquired by the silent alchemy of the subjective mind. Thus, the conception which was at first only vaguely recognized is restored to the objective mind in a definite and workable form. And then the objective mind acting through the frontal brain, the area of comparison and analysis, proceeds to work upon a clearly perceived idea and to bring out the potentialities that are latent in it. It must, of course, be borne in mind that I am here speaking of the mental ego in that mode of its existence with which we are most familiar, that is, as clothed in flesh. Though there may be much to say as to the other modes of its activity. But for our daily life, we have to consider ourselves as we are in that aspect of life. And from this point of view, the physiological correspondence of the body to the action of the mind is an important item. And therefore, although we must always remember that the origin of idea is purely mental, we must not forget that on the physical plane, every mental action implies a corresponding molecular action in the brain and in the twofold nervous system. If, as the old Elizabeth, Elizabethan poet says, the soul is form and doth the body make, then it is clear that the physical organism must be a mechanical arrangement as specially adapted for the use of the soul's powers as a steam engine is for the power of steam. And it is the recognition of this reciprocity between the two that is the basis of all spiritual or mental healing. And therefore, the study of this mechanical adaptation is an important branch of mental science. Only we must not forget that it is the effect and not the cause. At the same time, it is important to remember that such a thing as reversal of the relation between cause and effect is possible, just as the same apparatus may be made to generate mechanical power by the application of electricity or to generate electricity by the application of mechanical power. And the importance of this principle consists in this. There is always a tendency for actions which we are at first voluntary to become automatic. That is, to pass from the region of conscious mind into that of subconscious mind and to acquire a permanent domicile there. Professor Elmer Gates of Washington has demonstrated this physiologically in his studies of brain formation. He tells us that every thought produces a slight molecular change in the substance of the brain, and the repetition of the same sort of thought causes a repetition of the same molecular action until at last a veritable channel is formed in the brain substance, which can only be eradicated by a reverse process of thought. In this way, grooves of thought are very literal things, and when once established, the ver vibrations of the cosmic currents flow automatically through them and thus react upon the mind by a process the reverse of that by which our voluntary and intentional indrawing from the invisible is affected. In this way are formed what we call habits, and hence the importance of controlling our thinking and guarding it against undesirable ideas. But on the other hand, this reactionary process may be used to confirm good and life-giving modes of thought, so that by a knowledge of its laws we may enlist even the physical body itself in the building up 
of that perfectly whole personality, the attainment of which is the aim and object of our studies. And that concludes the end of chapter 14. This was a very intense chapter, diving into a very thorough explanation of the physiological and physical body and mostly the energy of the thought created and the impression. Oof. So he is definitely um, very cautious, advice giving us, saying how important it is for us to guard ourselves from undesirable ideas. So, I wonder how much deeper this is going to get. Are you? If you have any thoughts, comments, please do share them. And if you haven't done so, subscribe to my channel so that you could be um, notified anytime that I have something new. Okay. Sit back, relax. Let's move on to chapter 15.